you heard some machine learning yesterday and some questions open, especially um, about deep networks, and I want to address uh, one of them um, in my list of puzzles about deep networks. There are three questions. One uh, has to do with uh, approximation power. Uh, when are deep networks better than shallow ones? Why? Uh, why more than one layer is better often than just one layer? Um, I remind you that traditional classifier, meaning what was fashionable 10 years ago, like support vector machines or so, can be thought as uh, one layer, one hidden layer neural networks, okay, with just one vector of weights. But now we have networks that are quite deep, uh, five, six hundred layers or more. Um, yeah, why, why depth is good. Um, another one is uh, optimization. Um, you, why it's so relatively easy to find uh, um, good minima, even zero minima, of uh, uh, during training of the, of the error in testing. You are typically optimizing um, f a loss function that has hundreds of thousands of parameters, the weights, or millions. And um, it seems a very hard, it is a very hard optimization problem, but somehow it seems it works pretty well with techniques that are pretty simple, like gradient descent and variation of it, which are stochastic gradient descent. And the last question is the one I'm mainly going to spend time about, is uh, this question that was um, mentioned a few times yesterday about uh, uh, the fact that deep uh, learning seems to generalize well despite having more parameters than data. When I, I studied physics uh, a long time ago, I was told in the statistics class that if I had a model with 10 parameters, I better have at least 20 data points to fit the parameters. And, and now, uh, and this one seemed to be really uh, like a fundamental constraint, like, uh, you know, physical law. Um, but now, you typically have many more parameters than data. And people are happy about it. Um, so, what's going on? Uh, you know, Sasha addressed that, told part of the answer, um, but I want to um, get a bit deeper in this. So the first question, I just want to mention what uh, the, one of the main results is, is that um, if you have a function of, uh, say, d variables, uh, a generic function of d variables continuous, then uh, we know that shallow and also deep networks can approximate it as well as you want. And so this was known f since the 80s. This was one of the reasons why deep network fell out of favor then, because it looked like you don't need them to do this as good approximation as you want, but the price that both pay is the so-called curse of dimensionality. You need a number of variables, a number of um, parameters that is exponential in the dimensionality. So for instance, if you want to achieve, say, 10% error, you have um, 10 inputs, then uh, um, you need a number of parameters that is in the order of 10 to the 10, which is already a large number. And if your number of inputs instead of 10 is like, uh, I don't know, uh, what is it, 40,000, like for ImageNet, then uh, you get a real large number 
or parameters that you need to get a good approximation. So this curse of dimensionality was well known in many domain optimization approximation. Interestingly, there is a class of functions uh, which I, we called compositional functions that are functions of as many variables as you want, but are functions of functions, like up there. Um, the graph on the right is a graph of the function. Each node is a function of two variables. So this is a function of eight variables, but it's made up of functions of two variables. For a function of this type, shallow networks have still the curse of dimensionality, but deep networks with an, a, a similar hierarchical architecture avoid the curse of dimensionality. So the number of parameters they need is not an exponential in D, but to be linear in D. So that's a big advantage, potentially. And somehow this class of function seems to capture the idea that when we recognize, for instance, a min, an image, you don't need, so to speak, to have a function that look at the same time at pixel here and pixel here, but you can look at small uh, patches of the visual field and then make them interact, com do a computation on what you have computed on each of them, and so on, hierarchically. OK, there are other interesting, there are tons of paper coming out on approximation for deep networks. And uh, this is one of the basic results. The other ones have to do with some interesting properties of RLU functions. And um, a number of the people who have been uh, pioneers in uh, the area of wavelets are now working there, like Ingrid Dobeshi and uh, Ron Devore. Um, but anyway, that's another story. Yes? Yeah, could you uh, explain a bit more about the compositional functions? I don't think I understand what is it. It's, uh, you know, functions of functions, right? So it looks like recursive. Um, well, it's not recursive, but uh, you, if you can describe a function in terms of simple function, I can always often do it, right? Okay. I'd say. You would call that a composition of functions? Yeah. It's a composition of functions. So you mean if I can decompose it into a hierarchy, then it's a composition of functions? Yeah. Then it's not a surprising hierarchical Sorry? Net then it's not a surprising hierarchical neural network works better than the shared neural network. Yeah, it's not too surprising. I mean, uh, the, the proof of this theorem requires checking that errors don't propagate and in, in, cert in a certain way. So, uh, but the intuition, yes, it uh, should work that way. You know, you have to work it out that you really avoid the curse of dimensionality. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me skip the optimization. Let's go straight to, to the third puzzle. Um, and uh, before um, starting, let me define a few things. Um, um, I'm considering a, um, a deep networks, K layer, and, and so you have a matrix W1 acting on an input, which is a vector x, and then you have an RLU function on um, each of the outputs of the units in the layer. And then you have a W2 multiplying this, and so on, right? And the last layer does not have an RLU, it's just a linear combination. So that's a standard deep network. Uh, the only assumption I'm making here, I don't have biases, OK? I allow you to have uh, one of the components of the inputs to be a constant, like one. And this takes care of the bias. OK, so without biases, it turns out that um, um, this kind of network share an important property with linear function. 
And the property is that if, suppose I multiply the x by a, a positive number a, say 2. Well, then this thing is equal to 2 times sigma w1x. So in other words, I can put out the, this um, scaling factor out of the sigma. This is true for RLU. It's not true for sigmoids. And it's true for linear functions. Okay. All right, and, uh, um, and you can check, if you want, that you can do this layer after layer. And so in particular, if I have a network, this is a network, the input is x, these are the weights, matrices, first layer, k layer, I can rewrite this as um, the product of the norms of each layer. So I compute the matrix norm of each layer. For instance, row 1 will be the norm of W1. This will be, for simplicity, so-called Frobenius norm, which is here. So the norm is the square root of this, is the sum of the square of the matrix. And so I can take this row out for each layer. And instead of the W, now have a network in which each of the matrices has norm 1. I essentially normalized each of the matrices. I have now a network with weights, matrices that have norm 1. And I take the row out because of this homogeneity property. OK. Now, one more thing of, sorry for, it is just I put it here. Um, we'll, you, we'll need it later. I'll come back to this. Um, if I have, uh, um, this is a matrix or a vector, say. I consider this matrix is often as vector one um, row after the other. OK, think of this as vectors. Then uh, suppose I define a vector w as rho time v. And uh, so rho is a number, v is a matrix. Um, in particular, rho would be the norm of w. And V is essentially the normalized matrix. It's just what I said before. Okay? Now there are two quantities that I will need in the follow. One is what is the derivative of rho with respect to W. So it's the <coughs> derivative of the normal W with respect to W. And the other one is the derivative of the normalized vector um, with respect to the non-normalized one. And this is boring calculations that you have to go through. And the uh, results are written here. Okay. This is just has nothing to do with deep networks or properties of derivatives and normalization. It's ju just that I'll need it later on. OK. Now, in uh, um, um, if you are doing a regression, you are typically want to minimize on the training set the square error. That's one of the typical choices. This is your loss function. You are minimizing this. And then, uh, um, you know, hoping that what you find will be good at generalization, in other words, at predicting well what happens for new inputs x, not in the training set. Training set is 1 to n 
data point. Now, for a classification, and I focus on this, what happens, and this is typically the problem the deep network are dealing with, you cannot minimize because it's, uh, um, it's not smooth, it's not convex, the classification error. And so you're minimizing a so-called surrogate function. And in the case of deep networks, the typical one is the cross entropy, as you probably all of you know. The cross entropy in the case of binary classification, and for simplicity, I'll be dealing with binary classification, but everything should extend to multi-class. In the case of binary, it reduces to the logistic. And the logistic is very similar to the exponential loss. So I'm dealing to the exponential loss with simplicity, just don't want to carry around the log one plus exponential of the logistic, but they're very similar. So the idea here is that binary classification, y is the label, is plus one or minus one. F is your network and can give a real valued output, will give a real valued output. And so the idea is that if uh, you are correct, the sign of F is the same as the label. And so this exponent is positive, so it's always you have here something smaller than one, e to, to minus something positive. If you are wrong, this is the exponent positive, you get a big error, depending how big f is. Um, so that's a connection with the classification and zero, one loss, okay? Now, I can rewrite this in terms of, instead of um, f, I rewrite a rho will be the product of the norms, and f is my normalized network. So I'm just rewriting. OK, now, here is a quick motivation, um, essentially, of what uh, Sasha was saying yesterday, and uh, uh, Lorenzo, at some point, uh, dealing with regularization and so on is the idea that usually if you want to, um, to have your training error, this is your training error, to be close to your expected error, to the error you are going to do in the future, okay? If you are a quantitative hedge fund manager and you have an algorithm that you have trained and it does very well, on your training set. Lots of data from financial market until today. But you want to have a guarantee that if I bet a billion dollar about what the market is going to do tomorrow, you have to have the guarantee that you expect your future error to be close to the past error. That's a very important guarantee. That's generalization. So if you look at it, this tells you that the two will be close to each other if the right hand side is small. And the right hand side has something here that essentially depends typically on the number of data. The more data, the better, training data. And this other part that is a measure of the complexity of, of your networks in this case. And the idea is this grows with the complexity. So um, if you don't put any constraint on your networks, they can have as many parameters as they want, and uh, then you cannot really control this, guarantee that your future error is close to the past one. So the typical approach is these are called the Radamacher number. They're similar to VC dimension and so on. It's uh, um, a better way to count the degrees of freedom, not instead of a number of parameters, 
like Sasha said, that's not what is important. Is um, uh, often is the norm of the parameters which you control. Now we see this, but this is the quantity. And in fact, we, there is this property that for um, if you have a set of function f networks in our case, and uh, su suppose I write my networks with I did as I did before are a, a raw time the normalized version the Radamacher complexity becomes this. So the norm multiply the Radamacher complexity. Okay. So what is the function of R here? Sorry? What is the R here? What's the function of R here? It's, uh, it's um, a number that you compute for a specific network architecture. It's difficult to compute often. I'm just telling you this, this uh, uh, property of it that says um, that says that uh, it increases with the norms of the weights. In our case, okay. So if I write now this expression for um, using rho and f tilde. Suppose I, I put this rho equal 1. This is uh, a fixed complexity for a certain architecture. I don't know what it is, but it's a fixed complexity. I have controlled it. Cannot get bigger. And so this part is, con is controlled. And typically, this goes, becomes smaller with increasing n. And so I can, I have an upper bound on my generalization error. This is just a motivation. I'm not going, it's just, it's a, it's a classical approach to control the complexity of a network or a function. Sorry? The n is dimension. n is the number of data points. Oh. So th this is a classical motivation why we want to control uh, complexity of the network is a motivation essentially equivalent to regularization. We want to regularize in order to control complexity, and that's good for generalization. Are you concerned about rho being infinite? Sorry? Are you concerned about rho being infinite, like infinity? Well, if I don't control, um, I don't have any. Uh, here, here the idea is that I can fix rho. That's the, the, the weight, or like normalized. Yeah, typic for instance, in a lot of what I'm saying next, I fix rho to 1, just for simplicity. So I'm considering, I'm considering the complexity of networks of the given architectures with normalized weight matrices. So we're just to weigh the cases. Sorry? So we just don't cons uh, let's focus on the cases where the weight has a finite norm. Yeah, yeah, because in that way I control that term. This will not increase. It's, this is an upper bound it's, uh, set. OK, so um, all right, this is an example, for instance, of doing this, I'll come back to this later a bit, uh, an example of uh, looking at a normalized network. Um, normalized network, so normalized matrices. This is the cross entropy loss during training. And this is the cross entropy loss at test on a uh, um, on new data. And you can see this is a, essentially exactly this kind of relations where um, there is an offset and these are very close to each other. Okay, so this is the expected, this is the empirical, of course, the, and so this is the expected, this is the empirical, 
they are on the diagonal of slope one, and there is an offset, which is this Radamacher complexity. Okay, and this is for the cross entropy. This shows for the same data the test classification error, zero, one. And the test classification error is more or less monotonic with the cross entropy, right? So that's showing it's a, it's a good proxy. Um, what you try to do when you train is really you are trying to minimize the cross entropy. The classification error is something you use later, but uh, your goal is to minimize the cross entropy. Okay, so now, uh, this is the loss. If you do gradient descent, yes? Um, on the previous two slides, why is the range in X so small? Does the, does the trend hold for wider ranges of the training loss? I mean, it seems like for such a small range, most functions could be a constant linear. Uh, wait a second. This one? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, 0.004 Yeah, this is um, cross entropy. This was a network uh, on CIFAR. I think, I'm not sure Shani is here. It's probably three layers doing, doing okay, but not great. Um, I'll show you later some uh, state of the art results with the same pattern using REST nets. Okay, so the gradient descent you are doing, speaking about gradient descent in, uh, you all know stochastic gradient descent, instead of computing the gradient over the old training set, is computing the gradient over random mini batches from the training set, okay? I'll not speak about it. Um, I think all the results I'll tell you are valid for stochastic gradient descent. So let's gradient descent. And so what you are doing is um, you are looking at, uh, and again, I'm on the continuous case, so I don't have an explicit learning rate, but you can put it in. And the discrete case requires a, a more refined analysis. But you are looking at the dynamical system, the system of differential equations, that is a, a gradient of, given by the gradient of the loss. So you have equations of this type, um, when you take the derivative of the loss. And uh, I'm especially interested in the case in which, um, after some iterations, I have a situation in which the data are correctly classified. Now, if your network is linear, that's a strong assumption about the data that are linearly separable. If your network is a powerful 100 layers deep network, you typically can separate data that are very far from being linearly separable especially if you are over-parameterized. So that's not um, a big assumption. And this is, of course, um, the most interesting regime because, uh, uh, because, okay, I have a lot of parameters, more than data. It's not really a big surprise I can fit the data, I can, in this case, separate the data. But why? what I find should be good for new data. There are many, many, many solutions that I can find. Why what I find is a good one? So that's the interesting case. OK. Um, so let's try to, um, to follow the classical recipe. That's not typically what neural network have been doing, but it, we want to apply a norm constraint, a regularization type constraint. And before doing this, um, because I want to apply uh, this constraint of um, V, the norm of the V equal, equal one, 
before doing this, I rewrite the equations. I take um, this uh, loss function, and I take the gradient with respect to rho and v now. And uh, here, I should use uh, other variable names, but I don't do it for, for not. But in this case, v has, does not yet have norm 1. I have just rho is a number, v is a matrix. I just impose this, that's it, OK? And, and so the dynamics of rho, the norm at layer k, is uh, uh, chain rule of derivative is dl dw, dw d rho. And uh, um, dl dw is, uh, is, um, is this one. And uh, dw d rho is v transpose, just from here. And in this case, v dot is dl dw, dw dv. And in this case, again, dw dv would be rho. And then the other term is this, OK? I have not imposed any constraint. Now, this is the unconstrained gradient descent. How can I impose a constraint and impose that the norm of v is 1? There are several ways that are equivalent in the limit of the continuous. One is Lagrange multipliers. So I can add a Lagrange multiplier term that imposes norm of v equal 1. Another one is tangent gradient method. For is a Lagrange multiplier will be equivalent to adding a term like this. This is, and choose the lambda, the Lagrange multiplier, so that this is equal 1 at convergence. I'm not going this way, but keep it in mind, because this is equivalent to what we are going to do. And this makes some interesting connection with regularization, regularization with van vanishing gradient descent, um, so-called Halpern iterations, and so on. But I'm just saying, that would be one way. The other way that I'm doing, which is equivalent, is uh, to take uh, the dynamics that I want to constrain and project it using this projector. There is a theorem that says that it, if I do this, then that dynamic will obey this constraint for all t larger than 1, for all iterations. And this means that I take my unconstrained dynamics, I write it again here, and now I add here this s. I project, I should use different, this is a different v from this one. This one is unconstrained. This one is constrained because of this S. OK. Now, the interesting part is that this system of equations, the constrained one, in which I use this classical approach of putting a constraint on the norm, um, is exactly equivalent to weight normalization which is a technique used uh, quite a bit in uh, practical training of deep network, and which is itself closely related to batch normalization, which is probably used even more. Um, that's interesting because you know, it, they have been typically considered like uh, small variations of standard gradient descent. But here it comes out from imposing a regularization type constraint. The reason they are equivalent, these are the, the, the equation for, for uh, um, weight normalization, is that um, you can check, this is a little exercise, that using this equation, um, the norm of nu does not change with time. You, you just take 
the time derivative of nu square, and you check that it's zero because of properties of S. Little exercise. And it can help you because we, we, look, we found it together. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, now, but so this, this leaves a little bit of a puzzle. I have this weight normalization, which comes from imposing a regularization type constraint of neural networks. And then I have standard gradient descent, no constraint. And they seem to behave quite similar. Sorry, could I ask a question? So, so the tangent gradient. Yeah. What is, what, where is the tangent part? It is tangent to what? Is this S? It's called tangent transformation. This is. I can give you the original papers uh, twenty years ago. By. Is is a. It's tangent to the sphere, to the unit sphere. Unit. So it's projecting the unconstrained V on the unit sphere. Oh, so it's is, the, is the projection equivalent to natural gradient descent? On yes. Yes. Natural gradient descent. Uh, Lagrange multiplier, these tangent methods are exactly equivalent in uh, c the continuous limit. Um, okay, uh, let me see. I jumped. Uh, so, so now uh, to see a bit better, these are the What's going on? We take again the unconstrained standard gradient descent up here. Now, I don't impose a constraint. I just change variables in this equation. So I want to obtain an equivalent, completely identical system of uh, dynamics. But now the dynamics, instead of that in W, I want it in rho and V, where V is norm 1. So, so I have this. These are my new variables, um, rho and v. This is a relation with v. There are, these are the constraints. And then I go to do, a, again, chain rule is the, the rho, the v, the v, the t, which is the gradient of L with respect to v. And, uh, and I get, now I have to use these two equations that I showed at the beginning, you know, the one, um, these two. I have to use these two equations. This one, the rho de v and the v dw. And if you use those, if you use those, you get these two equations, OK? So these are a completely equivalent and unconstrained one. The S is the same as before, only that before it was coming because of the tangent projection method. There was a, a constraint that I imposed. Here it comes from the change of variables. OK, so the, if I impose the constraint, I get, as I said, weight normalization. If I don't impose the constraint, but I express it as new coordinates, I get very similar equations. They're not the same. The first one is the same for rho. The, uh, this one has a rho k, a denominator instead of numerator. 
Okay, I can show you in, in a little bit. This has critical points, so points at which the time derivative is zero, and that those critical points are the same for this and for this. So the gradient converges in terms of stopping when v dot is zero at the same points for both this and this. The dynamics is a bit different, but the critical points are the same. The reason is rho k is positive. So it does not really change anything. And so the two interesting observations I'm summarizing are one, that if you impose a constraint, you get, um, you get weight normalization. And uh, even if you don't impose any constraint, you are essentially performing minimization with a unit norm constraint. You have the same equations. So what not imposing means that you're running gradient descent. You get W after a long time. And then you are normalized at W. And that is give you the same um, convergence point than uh, for weight normalization or if you impose the constraint from outside. Now, this is something that uh, Natis Rebro showed uh, first time uh, like a year ago for linear networks. The, and they call it implicit bias of gradient descent. The fact that gradient descent um, essentially um, has this bias of um, converging towards, uh, this would be like a minimum norm solution, a maximum margin solution of these equations. So it's picking a particular one among all the infinite number of solutions that separate the data. Um, there are a couple of other interesting points, just mentioning it. Um, um, so, of course, if you look at the equation, um, if f separates the data, uh, you can see that the raw dot, the equations are, are have a positive, positive, this is positive because separation, this is positive because exponential, these are positive, so the time change of rho is positive. Rho grows all the time. Um, you can show that um, in simple cases, um, it grows in one layer case as log of t. Um, and you can show also that the weights in each layer grow at the same rate. I don't know if you've ever observed that empirically, but uh, they should grow at the same rate, the W. Um, this is here. And the critical points of the dynamics are the alpha n are positive numbers, essentially exponentials. And you have a sum over all the data points. And these are the equation that gives you when the v dot k is 0, so when your gradient descent stops. For instance, for a linear network, this will be, suppose you have one data point. You have x minus v, and then you have um, um, x um, uh, and the convergence will be when the w your weights become identical to your data point. So um, 
Um, and of course, what happens here is, as you wait longer and longer, the exponential will act as a soft max. So typically, one or a few of the data will survive. They will be essentially the equivalent of the support vectors. Um, but anyway, that, that's to give some intuition. And we also can uh, compute for the linear one layer networks the rate of convergence of the V. That's not the, the loss goes down pretty fast. But the convergence, that's an interesting point as Rebro make, the convergence to a solution that does well on terms of expected error or future date is much slower. And in fact, for standard gradient descent, the unconstrained one is 1 over log t, which is very slow. For weight normalization, it seems much faster. These are just uh, rough guesses under some assumption about number of data. And uh, um, there are connections with margin. But let me go back to this story. Um, this is uh, what happens if you train on uh, CIFAR, a free layer or so convolution networks. This is the cross entropy loss training of the unnormalized network. It's very small, cl very close to zero. And this is the testing loss, so the expected loss. You know, certainly you cannot say that the training loss is a good predictor of the testing loss. There is no generalization. But consider the same net. These are different networks. Each one had a different initialization. So are exactly the same parameters and so on, trained on the same data. But the different initialization gives them, when you stop, different performance, slightly different, not much. But from the training data, you cannot really predict how the testing will happen, no generalization. However, if you take uh, the same networks and you now normalize the weights, so basically you multiply the output of each network by one number, which is the product or the inverse of the products of the norms, and replot, then you get this. And here the training loss is a very good predictor of the testing loss. And the normalized network is, in any case, what you use for classification. Because whether it's normalized or not, what matters is the sign. Yeah, but the absolute value on the left side is still smaller than the right, right? Like the testing error on the left side is nevertheless. Sorry, say again. The uh, testing loss. Yes, it's smaller on the left side in the unnormalized case. Then on the right side, is what is this you were saying? It's smaller, yeah. I would yeah. just say maybe we we'll just increase the standard deviation of the initial weights and then still using the unnormalized, but because the absolute average. Well, um, let me show. Okay, so up there is the same uh, graph. Here is uh, a, uh, rest net, a, a rest net with 56 layers, I think, or so, something like that. And uh, um, this is the training loss of the uh, normalized network. And this is the testing loss, cross entropy. And this is the unnormalized one. 
just saying the absolute because there uh, on the left, in the anomalized case, the testing loss is between like, I don't know, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4, right? But on the right side is already the first digits is one point something. Yeah. So and so what? Isn't that saying like the anomalized case is better because we get the smaller error? Well, what you're using is the sign of the function, right? So yeah, I can control, um, for instance, I can improve performance by increasing the norm instead of one at the expense of increasing this gap. So having more uncertainty about how good my um, training error is a, as a proxy with the testing error. I'm not saying you can use, uh, do you want to be able to predict um, whether you know, this point or this point will do better in uh, testing? Forget how much, but we'll do, which one will do better? You know, in principle from here, I say in principle because there are caveats, but I can do this. Yeah, I, ca I cannot. So this is then the network with overfit to the training. Sorry? This is plotted with the networks with overfit to the training data. Yeah. And we had similar. Yeah, zero error for what? Yeah, it's all separation. Performance, but you're just looking at the losses. Sorry? Right? They had similar performance. Similar. Um, I mean, this, these are the same network. It's just a different way to plot it. But they have different classification tests. <coughs> some of them are better, some of them are worse. Some of them are the classification on the test. On the test set? Yes. Yeah. On the training set, they are all zero error classification. You said that the uh, the points of convergence are the same for normalized and unnormalized. So shouldn't the performance on the test set also be more or less similar? It's just a difference in the loss function. Well, th this is a different story. It's here I'm just taking train networks, and after the training, I normalize it. Right? So, uh, so that's a different way to plot exactly the same networks. Um, about your point, this convergence points is uh, are uh, local in the sense that depending on the initial condition, I may be in different regions of uh, of uh, the loss functions, and we know that the exponential loss function at infinity is completely degenerate, so it's all zero, right? Some zero are better than others in the sense. And th th there are open questions there to understand whether one uh, could uh, say more about uh, uh, what contributes to better, you know, some network having better performance than others. So if, if you started the two different loss regimes with exactly the same random weights? Yeah, then it's, it would be okay, the same. Yeah, here, here we started with different random weights. Typically, the, the bad networks have larger random weights at start. That's the way you gen we generate diversity. This also suggests, uh, uh, I'm going to finish, yeah, but if you look at, uh, at this, there, there are a couple of additional considerations, but the idea is that rho here is increasing because of gradient descent. But it should be possible to just perform minimization on V and control rho from outside the, at the rate you want. Mm 
that's you know, an idea for new classes of algorithms. What you want is rho going to infinity, but it's not clear what is the best rate or protocol for doing that. I'm not sure whether this is one of the summer projects. It may be, but. Oh, yeah. OK, other questions? Any complaints down there? <laughs> So we'll slide back. You said you characterize all the critical points by this sum over alpha n times a parenthetical term. Yeah. So I mean that that equation probably has many solutions. The set net equals zero. But one way is to just set all the parenthetical terms equal to zero for all the weightings. Sorry. Keep. One way is to set every parenthetical term in the sum equal to zero, and then you have a bunch of PDEs that you could theoretically solve for f tilde as a function of the weights. Is that possible, or have you guys looked at that at all? I don't know. That's a yeah. Maybe another project. <laughs> yeah, no, I d I, we did not look into it. You know, you can, um, you can, for instance, assume that after a certain given time, only one of the data point uh, is relevant. It's a support vector. The other ones, um, the margin of the other one is large enough, and so the, expon the sum of exponential. Is and uh, and then it's it's a simpler equation, right? But um, yeah, these are, uh, depending how you look at it. I actually looked into it a little bit, but it's difficult to say whether solutions always exist in this case, like you said. Right. They might exist, or they might not. It's actually very difficult. Yeah, I think the, the, in terms of the structure, they're kind of a bit similar, depending how you write to Riccati type uh, nonlinear equations. <coughs> But you know the linear case is simple when the network is linear um, and gives the results you expect, like um, support vector machine type. Um, yeah, uh, I think there is something interesting to do, which is not too much more difficult and has to do with a one-layer autoencoder. So two matrices, um, but this is pretty new. Yeah. Um, is there any, any other type of normalization that also has this effect of maximizing the? Yeah, this is maybe something I forgot to say. You can use this tangent projection method for any LP normalization, say L one or L zero or. At zero, I'm not sure, but anyway. And uh, if you do it, um, you don't get the equation. So, so the, the bias of gradient descent is that it works in the case of L2, but not otherwise. So otherwise, you, you don't get this. Yeah. Also in the cases where you don't use uh, uh, weight normalization. So it's well, because, so the, I, d I skipped a slide here, um, which, uh, um, let me see. I think we have a result that says that both in the constrained and unconstrained case, where the, the normalization is implicit. You have um, uh, convergence to the maximum margin. So in that case, why, why don't we see good prediction of the test loss based on the training loss when we don't? Sorry, sorry. Why, why don't we see a good prediction of the 
test loss according to the train loss uh, with the unconstrained version? You do if you use the normalized F. I showed you the yeah, graphs. That's why it's post training. Sorry? That's why it's after training. The normalization is after training. Yes. In a sense, you know, you can think of it as a pathology of the exponential loss. You can always drive to zero by having rho go into infinity if you have separability. But here you are finding for each rho in a sequence of increasing rho, for each rho, you are finding the F tilde, the normalized F, that does the best job, maximum margin. And that's what is, at the end, matters, right? Because it's the F tilde, the sign of it, that matters for binary classification. Okay, by the way, um, you know, in the spirit of the CBMM vision, I think this talk is not really CBMM because it's, it's uh, mathematics and mathematics, or mathematics, not very good mathematics, it's physicist mathematics, uh, but uh, um, still mathematics and uh, that's really engineering. So much better, Example is what uh, um, Margie spoke about. That's really what the engineers cannot find out by themselves. That's the science part. Of course, we believe the combination is great, right? Mm. Anyway. Yeah, I think, uh, that seems great. I just wanted to ask if this mathematics was somehow motivated by this one, yeah, like wow, I was motivated by the puzzle. I never believed deep networks have anything to do with the brain. <laughs> <laughs> but because as in there are some like biological algorithms which talk about homeostatic yes, uh, yeah, like scaling. Like, yeah, so I don't know if those sort of ideas. Yeah, I don't know, maybe, but uh, I find it, uh, you know, maybe the, the deep architecture may be biologically plausible, I find gradient descent uh, really not, you know. I may be wrong, I'm not saying I'm not able to prove anything, but I find it quite I biologically implausible. So from that point of view, it's more of, you know, crossword reason for doing this. But Amy, maybe these things help us understanding what learning means and the limitations of it. Uh, you know, from my point of view, deep, deep learning is just uh, um, doing a better job than kernel machines. But all of these techniques are like a lookup table. <coughs> maybe with some interpolating, extrapolating ability, but. Um, I think there is this not more than that. That's much less than something that we would call intelligence. Said that, I think that the explanation will be something like neural networks. Maybe not deep convolutional neural networks, although maybe may have a, a role in vision and some other sensory modality. Maybe, but. Uh, um, they will be in terms of neural network because the brain is a network of neurons. And uh, so, um, lunch time. <laughs>